Hello everyone, Lorenzo here. Today, I wanna to talk to you about a very, very important topic in both composition, arranging, um, and even improvisation, and that is counterpoint. That's something that a lot of people overlook, especially arranger, young arrangers. Okay, the importance of counterpoint on an arrangement and how you can base so much of what you do on the horizontal side of things, meaning the actual lines that you build within the harmony you're working on, rather than just thinking vertically. See, a lot of students just, um, you get trained to think vertically and analyze things harmonically, especially when you write it for big band. I see many students just kind of, uh, you know, voicing the chords and a, a lot of the arrangement is not very fluid because it's just very vertical, okay, very stuffy. Um, and what I came to realize, you know, with experience is the horizontality of, it, of things is what really makes it musical, the lines working together. So what is counterpoint is exactly that, one or more, like two or more lines working together, right? Um, and there are a couple of basic rules uh, that I teach in my big band arranging lesson. And it's actually, I start with this subject even before I teach voicings, I teach you how to write two effective lines, just two, right? You can amplify that, you can then double and you can then harmonize the counterpoints, right? But today I wanted to talk to you about some basic counterpoint rules that I teach to all my students. Um, so what I suggest you do this for practice is just grab any standard that you like or something that you would like to do an arrangement eventually of. In this case, I'm gonna show you that over uh, Days of Wine and Roses, a pretty nice chill standard. Um, and so just grab a traditional harmony, write the melody, write for an instrument, let's say alto, sax, trumpet, write the melody, but don't just write it lead sheet mode, write it as how you really hear it in your head, meaning rhythmicize it accordingly, meaning write the articulations, how you hear it, right? Do you hear it, ba 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 ba, or do you hear it, ba 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 ba, like you can even add notes to the melody, right? That's very important as an arranger to really disguise and transform the melody onto something that is really seasoned. That kind of sounds like you. You can make anything sound like you if you have, if you're aware of your own musicality, right? Okay, so counterpoint, two lines working together. So once you have that uh, rhythmicized melody of you on one staff, you can then write on another staff the counterpoint. Now, how the hell do you write a counterpoint, right? Um, the first thing, I'm gonna teach you some really quick tips and techniques, because then you, of course, you need to be really aware of the harmony of the chord tones, of the important chord tones, right? The third, the seventh, how to approach those and even approach those. But here's a very simple element, rhythm, right? The same thing I talk on improvisation, how you can use rhythm and simple rhythms to actually play motivic and create phrases that actually relate to each other. So one thing, as you can see now on the screen, um, so you can see on the screen here, I have the melody now written for alto sax. And I, instead of actually writing the entire counterpoint for the, um, for the tenor saxophone, I've just written the rhythms that I'm gonna use for that counterpoint. So how did I came up with that? Well, the first rule is activity in activity. Okay, that's, you don't have to super follow it, but it's a great way to start, which means if the melody is active, you're gonna have a relatively inactive counterpoint. And then if your melody is inactive, it's a good opportunity for you to enhance your counterpoint and add activity to your counterpoint. So you can see here, my melody starts pretty chill. Then I have the counterpoint. You see my counterpoint is very inactive because the melody on top is relatively active. You see on measure two, right? Measure three, same idea. Measure four, same idea, right? Then you go ahead and see measure five and six. I have um, kind of an inactivity meaning that there's a long note right on the melody and then I have all of this activity happening on the counterpoint, meaning more notes against one note, right? That is the activity in activity ratio. And you have to make sure that you don't do flams, meaning that you don't want to anticipate with one voice, let's say anticipate an eighth note and then do downbeat on the other um, voice. You wanna make sure that you either um, crash the downbeats together or anticipate together uh, if you have to do a flam, it needs to be intentional, meaning that you need to be aware of it, okay? Um, that's one of the rules I wanted to talk to you about today. Now, the second uh, uh, little rule I like to go by, so the inactivity activity, I like it because I can just write something like this and not even care about the notes. I just write my counterpoint according to the activity and activity levels I want. So I just look at my melody all through and then I just have this counterpoint kind of fill out all this, you know, you can see when the melody holds a note, my counterpoint all of a sudden becomes more active, okay? And that's really spicy. That's a lot of nice horizontality and curviness to the to your melody. Now, another 
really important rule is, or not rule, is something I like to do, is the one-to-one -one counterpoint, okay? So counterpointers, you know, if you study classical music, you'll get taught in different ways, but, you know, you can have um, one note against one note. You can have two notes against one note. You can have three notes against one note. All of that stuff, right? So that means if you have a half note, you can have another half note. You can have two quarters. You can have, etc. You know, four eighth notes and so forth. But the one-to-one -one counterpoint is something really nice, and that means that your counterpoint will play the same rhythm that your melody. Okay, you can see that right here on, where is this? Well, you can see it happening on measure four, right? In the end, they're both having quarter notes going on. You can see that on measure nine, where the counterpoint actually plays. I do already have some notes written down there, but um, plays the same rhythm. Now, they're not gonna play the same notes, and you have to be careful when you do this that it doesn't sound like a harmonization. Like, it needs to somehow sound like it's its own line. It's just playing the same rhythm but you don't want to you want to avoid going in thirds and stuff like that. So what I like to do is opposite direction, not right here, but in the next image you're going to see actually uh, even if it's the same direction, just something that crosses the voices differently, right? Of course, I want to leave the melody independent. I want to I don't want to go too close to the range of the melody. So my counterpoint is still far enough so I can leave some space for the melody. Okay, but those are two little nice rules, right? The rhythm have a very good balance of activity and activity between the counterpoint and your melody, right? Um, and then, of course, as you do the counterpoint, you can actually start thinking about important notes. Once you have the rhythm down, you can see, oh, here I want to land on the third. Here I want to land on the seventh. You have to look at your melody. If your melody is already landing on thirds and sevenths, you don't want to do that on your counterpoint. But if your melody is landing on like ninth or like in fifths and stuff like not thirds and sevenths, you might want to include some of those thirds and sevenths, approaching them on your counterpoint to enhance the chord sound. Remember, counterpoint, uh, you should still enhance the chord sound and appreciate it. It's just you're doing that with a line rather than with just voiced chords, okay? So now you can see uh, right here we have the developed counterpoint, and check out how I already have articulations going on. I don't just have the melody and the counterpoint. I, I have the slurs, I have this notes, like at the beginning you get ba ba, right? You get this accent, okay? So, of course, I'm not gonna talk too much right now about the actual notes I decided. They're based on chord tone sevenths and thirds and a little bit of chromatic approach. But you can see now the activity and activity level and what's happening between the alto sax and the tenor sax. And even when I do the one-on-one -on -one counterpoint, as you can see on measure 41, you see one is doing one is kind of doing going down and up and then the other one just keeps going down chromatically so even though they're playing the same rhythm it doesn't sound like a harmonization it sounds like a nice um kind of opposite direction line and then you see here on measure um 47 they're also playing one-on-one -on -one counterpoint but this is really cool it's when the counterpoint actually starts on top of the of the melody and then they just cross voices so they might double um, you see there's one note double there, the A, but they cross voices. So very important thing is try to avoid doublings, but they do work only in this situation when you cross the voices, and it's pretty nice. So we're going to hear this now. Um, just try to hear, right now for the purpose of this video, try to pay attention to the rhythm and the idea of activity and inactivity. Right? I'll make another video eventually talking about the actual notes you can do. But honestly, this all has the same principles I talked to in my Mastery Melody course. It all has the same principles of creating lines. You can create two independent lines. But in the case of the counterpoint, you're creating a supporting line, which means that you need to be aware of what's on your melody, right? That's the only difference. But it's the same concept of building great melodies, being aware of rhythms, being aware of your chord inversions and stuff like that, okay? So um, we're gonna hear this now and um, I hope you enjoyed this video and please DM me or PM me if you have any questions. And remember, I do teach private lessons on big band arranging. I don't have many slots, but uh, I do have a list and I take students sometimes. So if you're interested in really learning how to write for big band, and we're gonna start with a lot of this counterpoint stuff and then move to advanced voicings. And it's all gonna make really beautiful sense uh, when you actually understand the horizontality of this. The vertical stuff is just a lot easier because now you're basing your arrangements in melodies, right? Rather than just on block, on block chords. So just uh, let me know if you want more information. I can give you the information about my online big band lessons. They're private. It's 
you know, we adjust your schedule. And by the end of the um, eight, it's eight lessons, right? But by, by the end, I professionally record a saxophone piece. It's a five saxophone piece that you get to write simulating a big band. We also write a big band arrangement, but we don't get that one recorded, but we do get a saxophone piece recorded. So it's a really good deal. It's really great. I love teaching it. Um, you're going to get a lot of, out of it. It includes a lot of examples and materials. So I'm pretty sure you'll love it. Um, well, this is just a little counterpoint example, and I'll be giving out a couple of more examples on the following videos. Hope you enjoy this, and uh, please feel free to message me with any questions. So here's the example.